Welcome everybody to the what's already the second uh, last WISE Zoominar of the season. Um, today we'll be speaking about infragravity waves and we're delighted to have two speakers with us today. Uh, Janet Becker from both Scripps and UCSD who will speak first and Atre Niers from TU Delft who will speak second. Um, Janet, if we might start with you, I'm going to unshare my screen and if you could share. Perfect. So let me go full screen. I think a uh, wise Zoominar should start with a picture of a wave. And this was not taken by me. It was taken by Jeff Pledwell during um, Typhoon Dolphin that impacted Ipan Guam. And I'll be talking a bit about um, the impacts of this wave event. So the title of my talk is Wave Transformation Over Steep Fringing Reefs. And the motivation is that when you have a low-lying island or atoll, you can have flooding events and they may be triggered by large wave events or wave events that are not that big. And you'd like to know um, for early warning systems what kind of conditions lead to those events. So the top figures here are from Murray Ford, one of our collaborators at University of Auckland, and this is Majuro in the Marshall Islands. And we started the field work for this, um, these projects in the early 2000s. And at that time, we had ideas that sea level is rising everywhere. Satellites had gone up in the 90s. And this map here shows um, regional sea level trends over the period from 1993 to 2010. And the color bar is in millimeters per year. And the places that I'll be speaking about today, which are Guam, Kwajalein, and Majuro, are in what looks to be a hot spot of sea level rise. So if background water levels are high, it doesn't take a lot of wave energy to lead to flooding events. If you go to the University of Hawaii Sea Level Center, um, you can update this map. And this now goes from 1993 to 2021. And while the trends are a little bit smaller, you can see now everywhere is showing sea level rise trends. So sea level rise does have spatial variability and temporal variability. Um, we know it's rising and the sites that we're looking at are in the um, Western tropical Pacific. So a little bit about me. Um, I did my PhD with John Miles at UCSD at Scripps and um, I worked on cross waves, but um, in a situation where waves were generated from this figure from a vibrating cork that Faraday did in 1831, and it made a star-shaped pattern around the cork, so it was a symmetry breaking instability. After that, I went to Australia, where I worked on resonant triad interactions on a mean flow, um, back to Scripps, where I worked with Rick Salmon on the large-scale ocean circulation. But most of my career has been spent in Hawaii, which is the, where I started this work. And since 2017, I've come back to Scripps, and I do a lot of teaching. And again, I have another waves picture here. So the data for um, this project is from two main field programs. One was funded by NSF, which was in Majuro and Roy Namur Kwajalein. Um, and the reefs here are shown by um, a digital globe image. So this part of the image is the reef. This white part is a narrow band where waves break. This is where people live in Majuro in the Marshall Islands. So CMI is College of the Marshall Islands. And here is a set of sensors that we've deployed in a cross shore transect across the array. Same thing for Roy Namur, which is part of Kwajalein. There's a military base here. And then Ipan is a fringing reef. So these two are atoll atolls that have lagoons in the middle and Ipan has an island and a fringing reef. But in all these cases, narrow break zone, reefs have different lengths. Um, so the longest rank length reef is Ipan. Water levels are dominated by tide in Majuro and Roy Namur. So um, there's a large tidal range. That's why we chose this spot because um, different tidal stands can be a proxy for sea level rise. And I call the water level at Ipan setup dominated, and I'll explain a little bit more what I mean there, but it doesn't have a big tidal range at Ipan. So um, just as motivation still, 
this is Majuro, and there are a lot of people that live in this little bit of land, and it is very vulnerable to these flooding events. And so if you can have a skillful prediction of wave-driven inundation, you can mitigate hazards. And so this is um, a set of photos from Carlos, Carl Fellinius. Um, so the background water level, just tide and non-tidal residuals was 1.6 meters. It only takes about two meters of water to flood. And so during this wave event, there was a contribution from the um, that event, which I'll describe what I mean by the 2% exceedance statistic in a minute of just over half a meter and it led to inundation. And this, um, there is a warning system in the Marshall Islands that is based in part on um, Mark Merrifield's work that was published in 2014 in GRL, which I'll say a few words about. But there is a caveat here. So Murray wrote a paper in 2018, Natural Hazards. So the Majuro doesn't only flood by waves, um, swell events impacting from across the reef, it can also inundate from the lagoon. And so if you are gonna set up an early warning system, you want to be aware of all types of flooding methods because if residents rely on your warning system and you miss one because you haven't thought about all different ways things can flood, then your system is lacking. Okay, so back to this typhoon dolphin, that first figure that I showed you, there was um, a typhoon that took a near direct hit on Guam, that picture that I showed you in the front, when the waves break, they elevate the water level. And you can see this fishing tower here. And there was um, a large increase in water level from this extreme event. And we have details about that extreme event from a coastal data information program at Scripps Buoy 121 that showed that at the peak of Typhoon Dolphin, we had near seven meters significant wave height. It was long period, and it was coming nearly shore normal to um, Ipan. So that event did lead to inundation. We don't have a lot of inundation events at Ipan, many more at um, Majuro and Kwajalein, but that inundation, the measurements that we have of the inundation include some photographs that show run up detritus and waves crashing into trees, but the measurement that we have from our array is only at the shoreline. And, but that is a very important measurement because it shows extreme water levels. And the blue line is the total water level that was measured by a pressure sensor that was deployed about 50 meters from the shore. And the red line is a low frequency um, filtered between 25 seconds and 1,000 seconds. And you can see that nearly everything is um, low frequency energy. So the title is Wave Transformation Across Steep Reefs. And so if I have a schematic of a pond here with a complete array of sensors, I can look at the um, bottom pressure, correct it to the free surface elevation using linear wave theory. And this is 15 minutes of observations, which show wave groups that are incident normally on the reef face. And then if we go to the shoreline, we see that we have the remnants of these groups, um, but a low frequency version. And this is seen in this spectrum, so meters squared per hertz on the y-axis and frequency on the x-axis. And so the blue um, trace is the spectrum at sensor eight, and the black trace is the spectrum at sensor one, where red and green are sensors four and two. And so we see the sea swell band here, I'm defining between five and 30 seconds, and that can vary depending upon the period of your incident waves, but the sea swell band decays. There is um, a strong enough wave signal that you have some bound wave energy in that I call IG in the 30 to 200 seconds, which is this little bump. And then if you look at the shoreline, the largest signal is between 200 and 1000 seconds with still significant energy um, in the mean field, which is the breaking wave setup. So sea swell, infragravity, far infragravity, and then breaking wave setup. So we want to um, 
understand, why is my little thing not going now? We want to be able to understand how to um, describe extreme water levels. And so from that hour and a half record that I showed you that we had at the shoreline during Typhoon Dolphin, we can take out the tidal and non-tidal residual, which is um, only about four tenths of a meter at Ipon during that event. It doesn't have a big tidal signal. And then we have something that we call the 2% exceedance water level, which means that the water level is going to exceed this line 2% of the time. 98% of the time, the water level is below the line, 2% it's above the line. And for that extreme event, there was about 1.2 meters of wave setup. And then there was an additional contribution due to the waves that added another about seven tenths of a meter. So, um, Speaking first to breaking wave setup, we wrote, published a couple of papers. Oliver Vetter was a master's student in Hawaii, and then um, there is a paper that looks at all three sites. The Vetter paper just looks at Ipon, and this figure is just showing Ipon. And what I have at this plot is the significant wave heights from the sea dip buoy. And this is Tropical Storm Man Yi that happened in 2007. This is an energetic record. And I'm going to speed up a little bit, but just to tell you that the breaking wave setup is highly correlated with the incident reef face wave height. You can model it by balancing radiation stress gradients with pressure gradients. I have a simple model in Vetter and Becker et al. where there's a point break where waves shoal to a breaking wave height and then they break completely not completely to a residual wave height, and you can come up with an empirical breaking wave parameter. So we understand setup. We want to now talk about the contribution from the waves to the 2% exceedance. So there's the setup, and then there's a part that depends upon the sea swell wave height at the shore and the infragravity wave height at the shore. So up here are measurements of infragravity and sea swell wave height, and infragravity goes all the way down through the far infragravity band. And we can see that the red is the dominant signal in the shoreline response. We have some sea swell, it's depth limited breaking, but that breaking is nearly complete. And so the part of the 2% exceedance due to waves is largely IG, which is shown by these red dots. I could include the sea swell, but if I understand the IG, I can understand the 2% exceedance. So now I wanna talk about a paper that one of our graduate students, Christine Pequignier wrote in 2014. And it really speaks in detail to what happens to IG as it moves across the reef at Ipon. And what's useful about this paper is she had both pressure sensor and current meter measurements. So she was able to calculate kinetic and potential energy as well as energy fluxes. And so what happens is if you look between sensors seven and eight, the infragravity wave energy I'll describe on the next page. But on this page, we're gonna talk about the relationship between the wave energy, kinetic and potential at sensor seven and sensor five in two different frequency bands. So if you're in the IG frequency band and hers started at 20 seconds because her wave events were more like 10 seconds, you find that at sensor five, you have less energy in the IG band after you've crossed the reef crest than you do in when you were on the reef face. So there's been a decrease in the infragravity energy. And that's also shown in this plot. There's a shoaling and then a decrease. So this is sensor seven to sensor five. However, in the lower frequency band, the far IG band, it is the opposite. You see an increase in energy in the far infragravity band across the reef face. And that's consistent with that spectrum that I showed you earlier, that the most energetic signal on the reef flat is the far infragravity. She did something nice with fluxes and um, you reading the paper will give you more details, but she computed by spectra and showed that bound waves existed on the reef face, but not on the reef flat. And the breakpoint forcing on the reef face, which would be a full 180 degrees out of phase with a deep water bound wave, um, works against the bound wave. And that's shown in this middle panel. So the first panel here, where we have the free surface elevation broken up into a sea and swell and a long wave component, same with the velocities, 
you can move into the frequency domain and balance the divergence of a flux with nonlinear transfer and dissipation. And so she carefully evaluated all of these terms. This is the nonlinear transfer, which is the working of the radiation stress gradient against the long wave. We have Stokes drift in a definition of radiation stress. But what happens is that we pump energy into both the IG and the far IG, as you show on the reef face. But when you get across the reef crest, the IG dies and the far IG increases. Once you're on the reef flat, you have dissipation. So I want to say a little bit about a theory that is useful for explaining um, being able to predict the IG wave heights given a little bit of knowledge of the forcing. So the setup balance was pressure gradients balancing radiation stress gradients. But if we want to talk about the low frequency, we need to add time derivatives. And I brought in some dissipation as well as the continuity equation. You can do an EOF analysis and show that the low frequency variability is modal. Being John Miles' students, I like to do um, integral transforms, but it was a natural thing to do for this problem. So if you use cosine and sine transforms, you can take the dynamics and project onto these modes. And the interesting part that comes out of this is that you can use information from this breaking wave setup problem where this gamma B is a breaking wave height over a breaking water depth. And then the time scale of the forcing is the envelope of that wave group that you see at sensor eight on the reef face. So you have a simple equation. It is just a damped harmonic oscillator, but the forcing is interesting in that the forcing is bigger if the water level is bigger on the reef. And then the temporal dependence is due to breakpoint forcing, which is um, explained by the envelope of this time series on the reef face. So I can solve this and I only have one tunable parameter in my model, which is the damping. And in 2016, I wrote one of my favorite papers where I put the best figure at the end. So it's not, um, that's not the best strategy, but um, I'll show that figure that I like in a minute. Um, but on the x-axis is the observed infragravity wave heights, meaning IG and far IG, and on the y-axis are the predicted. And we have a site at Saipan at Ipan, Guam with tight fit, um, College of the Marshall Islands and Roy Nomura, a little bit more scatter, but we still do a good job at predicting the IG. So this is the figure that I like. And um, if I don't, if I undo my cosine transforms and moving into the frequency domain for the time dependence, I, what I have is a forced damped wave equation. And I can non-dimensionalize it using setup as my um, basic state and have one non-dimensional parameter, which is the damping, the reef length, and then the square root of G HR is the reef flat water level is in the denominator. And so what happens is when delta is big, you have a diffusion equation with forcing and your infragravity at the shoreline, which has been normalized with the sea swell significant wave height on the reef face, just kind of peters to shore, you're in a dissipative re regime. But if you're in a situation where either you have not too much dissipation, a relatively short reef or relatively deep water on the reef, delta becomes small and you get more of an amplification of infragravity at the shore. So in my abstract, I said that there was wave-like or dissipative behavior. And I think this is figure 13 in Becker um, 2016. So you have to wade through a lot of stuff to get here, but. I think it is a good way to classify reefs. So just quickly, um, I wanted to return to the warning system problem, which um, Mark Merrifield wrote in 2014. And so we talked about that 2% exceedance and we, can, we know what the breaking wave setup is. And his work is for, um, Roy Nomura and CMI. This has not been done for EPON yet. I'm working on that right now. Um, but in any event, we have the breaking wave setup cont contribution to the 2% exceedance. And then we have the bit that's due to the sea swell and the IG wave heights at the shore. And if you use my model for predicting the IG and what you can get from sea swell, you do a really good job predicting the 2% exceedance. 
But what Mark did, which makes sense, is he made a simpler model where he used that breaking wave height, which is derivable from the setup and had a very simple um, proxy for the 2% exceedance, so an empirical formula. And so what he then did was he hindcast various flooding events in the Marshall Islands. So that regression led to about a third of the breaking wave height with an offset. And he went backwards in time and used conservation of energy flux from wave watch three to the breakpoint, which I describe in the setup paper, and was able to use this formula for 2% exceedance to be able to hindcast flooding events that had happened. So there was a December 2008 flooding event, which is pictured here, which is captured in this hindcast where you add the tide and the non-tidal residuals to that 2% exceedance water level due to waves. He took that further um, and went back to 1979, where there was a large flooding event. And you can see that that's captured in this prediction. And so um, what is good about that is it's something simple and is what is being used um, in part in the pac IUS early warning system free pawn. So just a couple more things. Um, taking a breath. This is the CDIP buoy record for when we have shoreline measurements. And the, there are a couple things to notice. One, we had a big event in 2007. And around this time, we had that array fully um, set with pressure sensors and current meters. But as we move later in the time period, things became more energetic, but we only had limited observations. The work I'm doing now is on this limited set. Um, we had two big events. The shoreline response was quite small. And so my work in progress is to, instead of using a full array to predict shoreline IG, what can I do from the buoy? And I'll just stop here by saying that we can leverage things about the buoy where we can get a vertical heave from the buoy. We can return to our linear model where forcing is now done using the envelope of the buoy, and we can predict the extreme IG at Dolphin given that information. This top plot is just showing um, for a particular site, you need to think when you're using offshore rather than incident observations, you need to think about peak period as well as direction. And what we find at Epon is amplification of the incident waves is much larger if you are coming from the north and if you have longer period. So collaborators and photos, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Janet. That's excellent. Thank you. I'm going to just mute. I'm just going to mute one participant. Do we have uh, any questions? Please just raise your hand or indeed unmute and speak. Some applause. Ah, we have one question from GPS, which presumably is an acronym. GPS, please go ahead. Hi. Perhaps you could see me or not, yeah. I don't know. Please, uh, we can. Please introduce yourself and. Uh, yes. My name is George. I work at uh, HR Wallingford in the UK. I'm part of the Meteorocean team. Um, my question, I have two questions. One, how does the length of the reef influence the transformation to the infragravity band? And, and the second question is, how does what is at the inside of the reef? So if you, if you would have a hard structure like a coastal wall, how would that influence the same process? Thank awesome. You. Thank you. I didn't get to that. So there's um, the length of the reef sets the frequency of the modes that can be excited, right? So um, I didn't 
explain that carefully, but it's in the paper. So we have these quarter wavelength modes that are excited. And so for EPON under normal water conditions, the lowest frequency mode is about 13 minutes. You're not gonna see it, but once you get higher water levels, you can have modes that are more like five minutes. And the envelope of the forcing, if it is narrow band, you can have energy. The spectral content of the envelope matters. The phasing of the forcing matters. We're not just using a John swap spectrum to force the model. So it influences both the modal frequency, which needs to match the forcing. It also influences that parameter delta. So if it's really long, you have a lot more time for dissipation to act. Um, in terms of the hard wall, it's that's another excellent question. So um, that sets up modes, right? You have reflection. But what I didn't mention in this talk is with Murray, we worked on some problems where they don't have building material in the Marshall Islands. So they actually dig pits in the reef. So that actually changes the transformation. And Yao Yu, one of our postdocs, did some work on that. And someone more recently um, from Europe has worked on that data set. So, but I think um, I like my 2016 paper. I didn't write it. I should have probably put it in a little bit of a different order, but I think that it explains clearly how when you look at a reef, you should classify it first. So look at its length, look at how rough it is, look at what the um, kind of water level would be like on the reef flat. That sets modal periods, which are excited by forcing and um, also then gives you some sense of whether you should be worried about it, right? Because if it's dissipative, not much is going to happen. Thank but, you. Uh, thank you, Janet. Yeah. I'm just... Yeah. Uh, Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. great. Um, Fabrice, uh, you have a hand up. Please ask your question. Yeah, if there's nobody else, uh, just a very nice talk, uh, Janet. Uh, I had a quick question. You're, so you're working lately on, with the envelopes. I was wondering, uh, at some point, I guess, that it's uh, really the, the spectral density at the very low frequency of the envelope that, that probably matters. And I guess that could be captured maybe by some kind of uh, peak and S parameter of the spectrum. So I don't know if you looked at oh, that. Oh, no, absolutely. You've answered That's something that models that. might be able to get, if you're not maybe very accurately, I don't know. No, no, it's awesome. So what's happened is um, my new um, joy in life is to exploit the buoy, but not the bulk statistics. So we can come up with new statistics from the heave time series, which can include, you know, like significant wave heights associated with the envelope and the low frequency band, or it could be just peakedness conditions. And there's, I had a student do some interesting work with just looking at model spectra and how they actually relate to the real spectra. I find the peak period to be very squirrely. So um, I don't like computing that. I like average period or spread. No, I'm not saying that models aren't great. What I'm just saying is that it's a That's linear thing noisy. because yes. um, the four scenes, the game. And there were a lot of details I didn't go into, but I um, hope that um, a lot more work needs to be done on this. And it'd be great if anyone wants to um, contact me about any of this. So I think we're right at 29. Yeah. And I can see, see if there's a one, any final questions for Janet? No, well, thank you, Janet, for uh, uh, an excellent talk. Um, let's move over to the second speaker, uh, Art. Yep. So if you can share your screen. Over to you, Art. All right. OK, thank you uh, for the opportunity to uh, give a presentation on the uh, infragravity wave modeling that uh, we are uh, developing with uh, SWAN. Uh, SWAN is a phase average model, so um, it's not typically used for uh, infragravity modeling. Um, but uh, we're trying to include it. Uh, my uh, co-authors are uh, given here. Um, and it's uh, work that is being supported by uh, Rijkswaterstaat, or the Dutch Ministry of Infrastructure and Modern. Um, I don't have a picture of a wave, uh, Janet, but uh, this is, uh, let's say, my uh, depiction of a, a wave uh, wave group. Um, and this is to uh, to explain uh, the background information or the, the relevance of what we're doing. Uh, so uh, we already uh, discussed wave groups. Um, the, the the modulation of the wave groups actually create uh, infragravity waves that are propagating with these wave groups, and I'll call them uh, wave group forced infragravity waves. So that's what the WGF stands for. Um, 
we know they propagate towards the coast, um, but there is also a possibility of free infragravity waves um, that propagate towards the coast. Uh, all of this is uh, met uh, by, uh, let's say, a sandy uh, barrier, and then uh, part of that is being reflected again. Now, the thing is that um, um, in the Netherlands, we're, we're moving from, a, let's say, a more empirical assessment of uh, flood safety for extreme conditions to uh, a process based. And for that, uh, we would like to use the, the X beach uh, model in serve beat mode. Um, and of course, uh, this uh, X beach model, which resolves the, the wave groups, it needs a boundary condition. And the question is, uh, what is that boundary condition? Uh, what should that boundary condition be for extreme conditions? Um, and uh, can we actually account for the presence, the potential presence of free infragravity waves? Um, so that's one part. The other part is, of course, we'd like to know uh, how do these wave groups and associated wave group enforced, wave group forced infragravity waves evolve? over a, a sloping bed, uh, and is that something that we need to take into account? So I have uh, two approaches. Um, one, so in this presentation, there's two parts. Uh, part one is uh, focused on uh, remotely generated free infragravity waves. So, and then particularly the ones uh, that arrive at the coast. Uh, and the second part, I'll uh, discuss some of the work that we're doing in trying to uh, predict the wave group forced incident and reflect infragravity waves that are more at, at the local coast. Um, so for the, uh, the free IG waves, um, um, we are looking at uh, arrival of uh, infragravity waves from uh, adjacent shores uh, using the, the method that was uh, outlined by uh, Fabrice in 2014, and we specifically focus on the North Sea Basin. And there's some, uh, if you want to know details, then there's a recent paper by Reinstorp et al. Um, and we think the North Sea Basin is, uh, is a potential candidate for these uh, cross, crossing free infragravity waves because of the relatively uh, shallowness of the basin. So um, we are going to define a source line and then we compute the propagation and potential trapping of these uh, infragravity waves. And we have some measurements that we can compare with. So I'll show some of that. And then in the second part, I specifically will talk about uh, what happens in the, in the near shore zone, uh, where we have wave group force incident, incident infragravity waves that are uh, pumped up as they propagate towards the shore and uh, get released. So first part, uh, remote free IG waves. So what you see here is a, a map of uh, the North Sea. Um, and uh, what we're interested in, of course, is uh, how waves that are, let's say, infragravity waves that are generated at uh, Denmark, how they could potentially arrive at the Dutch coast, because if that's significant, then that's something that we should take into account in our boundary condition. Um, so what we've done is we've uh, defined these uh, source lines uh, along all the different coasts uh, in the North Sea Basin. And they color code it. Uh, and that's basically for us, because then uh, that way we can discriminate uh, which part of the coast contributes to uh, the total infragravity wave height. Uh, we are using the, as I said, uh, the method by uh, Fabrice. So we have a, a prescribed frequency spectrum. So the, sp the spectral shape is given on the left, but most of the energy in the in the lower infragravity uh, range. It's omnidirectional. So uh, we are assuming that the waves are propagating in all directions. Um, it has one calibration parameter that we're using. And uh, it's uh, the source function is defined that in this case at a water depth of about 20 meters, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and it's uh, controlled by the, the significant wave height and the measure for the wave period at that depth. So that, that determines the, the strength. So if we want to run this uh, in a model sense, we actually need information about uh, the significant wave height in this period. And so for that, we use the ERA-5 model. And I think that's, okay, I'll get to that next. So to be able to, test this model, uh, we are going to make use of observations of uh, the infragravity wave height 
Ah, that's what I forgot. So infogravity wave height that we measured at the North Sea. And if you look here, we have uh, location A12, which is at the Dockers Bank. Uh, Q1, which is in the northern part of the Netherlands. So this is the Netherlands. And Europort, which is in the southern part. So we have these three locations that we will use to compare with uh, uh, the model output. Um, the observations that uh, were done uh, over the last, uh, what is it, 18 years, I think, um, where we have at these locations, we have actually the frequency directional C swell spectra, uh, which is on the right. Uh, we do not have measurements uh, that we can use to do bispectral analysis. So uh, in, we have to use a theory to uh, estimate the bound part of the spectrum. So for that, we use the, the work, uh, the method of Hasselmann. So given the frequency directional spectrum, we, we recalculate what the bound part is of the infragravity waves. Uh, we integrate over a frequency range. And this is uh, somewhat particular, but uh, you see that we're actually integrating over a very narrow range here with the infragravity waves ranging from 200 seconds to uh, 100 seconds. And the reason for that has to do with the, the sampling method that was used in the past to, uh, to measure the surface elevation. So it's a limited range, um, but it still, it gives us uh, a good information. And it's also because we expect the most energetic conditions actually to be in this frequency band. Now we are interested in the uh, the free infragravity waves. Uh, so we, from the measurements, we get the total. Um, the R squared again has something to do with uh, the, the measurement method. But from having the total and the estimated bound, we can actually get an estimate of the free infragravity waves. So that's what you see over here. And this is what we compare compare what we can compare to the model. Um, this is an animation of uh, the storm. So I'm going to start with a storm that happened in 2013. Uh, in the Netherlands, it's known as the Santa Claus storm because Santa Claus arrives at a different time in the Netherlands than uh, elsewhere. Um, and what you see on the left is uh, the era five prediction of the significant wave height. Um, and in this case, uh, the color coding uh, is uh, where you uh, can deduce what the wave height is. So it reaches up to 10 meters. Um, and at the right, uh, we have the swan predictions of the infragravity response. So basically when, uh, when the storm hits Denmark, you see it light up and you see the infragravity waves radiating away from the Danish coast towards the UK. Uh, and as it turns out, also partly towards the, the Dutch coast. So um, with these predictions, we can uh, look at what happens at these different uh, measurement locations and then compare. Um, this is a bit of a busy plot. Uh, so on the left is just a snapshot of uh, the significant wave height and the infragravity response at the peak of the storm. The upper right plot is actually a comparison of the predicted uh, sea swell conditions of the ERA-5 model um, at the three different locations. And uh, overall, you can see that it's actually a very nice uh, prediction. So. That tells us that let's say the the source function that we're using um, uh, that we have some confidence that it's probably a, a good representation of the source function. And then in the lower plot, that is uh, the comparison with the Swan predictions. Uh, the model is in the in the markers, and the observations are in the solid line. So this is the estimate free infragravity wave height. Uh, and what you see is that um, at the onset of the storm. There seems to be significantly more free infragravity energy than what we predict from our models. Um, at the moment, we don't understand exactly why, but that could be a different mechanism, uh, potentially release or uh, uh, gustiness of the wind and things like that. Uh, but once uh, the storm is uh, uh, at its peak, we see that uh, the model is actually giving a fair prediction for the infragravity wave height at all three locations. So. We're both in the middle, but also closer to the coast. And the model details are uh, given at the, at the bottom. So instead of looking at a single uh, event, a single storm, um, we can also look at multiple storms. And that's what you see here. Uh, we've defined a skill measure and also a, a bias. Um, there's uh, 
on the bottom, you see the observed infragravity, free infragravity wave height, and on the vertical axis, the predictions. Um, and the color coding is um, to give you an idea where they originate from. So if it's red, then it's from Denmark. If it's blue, it's from uh, the UK coast. And if it's green, it's um, from the Dutch coast. So let's say um, more local. Um, so if it's A12, so that's in the in the middle, huh? so it's sort of in the middle of the, the, the North Sea, we see that the, the biggest response is from uh, Denmark. So Denmark radiating out, and that's, uh, uh, that's mostly evident at that uh, location. And if you go to the Dutch coast, uh, the biggest events are locally trapped at this point, but you can also see, if you look carefully, there's also contributions in blue and red which means that uh, at times there is a, uh, we see waves uh, entering from Denmark or the UK and arriving at these locations, at, at least according to the model. Uh, the problem that we have here is that uh, at the moment we don't have directional information. So this is just based on the, uh, the total infragravity wave height. Um, these uh, differences are again related to what happens at the onset of the storm. So typically, uh, that's when we underestimate at least at this location. So quick summary. Um, I didn't show everything, but uh, so that we actually observed that if we look at the conditions, uh, infragravity waves between 100 seconds and 200 seconds, then they're generally dominated by the presence of free IG waves. Um, that's something that uh, you can also see in the paper. Um, on the North Sea, uh, we can actually uh, show that uh, a lot of it can be explained by the arrival of infragravity waves from distant shores, and that these contributions at 20 meter water depth. So I haven't, uh, I've, I didn't mention the water depths, but these stations are in between 30 and 20 meters water depth. Uh, we see that that during extreme storms they have a significant response in the infragravity uh, zone um frequencies um and at the dutch coast uh, we see that the main contributions of the free ig waves are from locally trapped waves but also from contributions from arrivals from both the danish and the uk coast so this is, gives us a method to predict let's say the presence of free infragravity waves at the scale of the north sea and then i'd like to move to the second part um because that's only part of the picture, uh, we also would like to know, okay, what, what should we impose at the boundary, which is locally generated? So this is where uh, we're going to explore the evolution of wave group force, infragravity waves. And currently, um, the model assumes that all the waves are bound, right? so we're using Hasselmann's, me Hasselmann's method. And we're interested in uh, establishing whether that's always a good uh, approach, especially if you consider extreme conditions and uh, a sloping beach. Um, so what we do is uh, within uh, SWAN, we have uh, what we call now uh, the SWAN uh, surbeat mode. So it's, uh, it's actually assuming that the beach is a longshore uniform. Um, and we have a, an equation that uh, predicts the evolution of the wave group forced infragravity wave. So that's the, the first set of equations. Uh, on the left is the energy flux uh, that uh, Janet also discussed. And on the right is um, the work done by the radiation stress uh, that actually can feed into the evolution of these uh, infragravity waves. Um, as you can see, the, the response is strongly dependent on the, on the biphase. So this psi uh, represents the biphase. And for that, we have an additional, uh, an additional equation that uh, depends again on the radiation stress, but also on uh, the evolution of the, uh, the infragravity wave itself. So this is actually a, a coupled equation and these, two equations need to be solved in tandem. Um, but if we solve all of that, then uh, we, uh, we can get the, the infragravity uh, response that is forced by these wave groups. We integrate over the relevant uh, frequencies. And then we have, again, a measure for the infragravity wave height. And this is the incident infragravity wave height. 
To give you a bit of a feel for uh, what that looks like, uh, I consider a relatively uh, simple case uh, where we have uh, a fully modulated uh, wave field made up of two wave components. And I actually picked the components that uh, Tom Herbers and uh, Burton used in 97. Uh, so the deep water amplitudes are 0.2 meter. Uh, they have different uh, frequencies. So we have a modulation uh, in, in time and space. Um, so on the upper left plot, huh, you see the, let's say the instantaneous uh, wave height that is uh, propagating towards the, the coast uh, as a result of the interference between these two components. And you can imagine that the radiation stress as a result is also modulating at that same scale. Huh? So uh, that brings me to this equation over here. So this, uh, the evolution of the infogravity wave is then a a function of the shoaling, but also the forcing, which is on the right-hand side, um, where the radiation stress is made up of these two components. And then I'd like to draw your attention to the upper right plot that actually uh, shows the evolution of the bound infogra uh, of the wave group forced infogravity wave height um, and uh, the subsequent or concurrent evolution of the biphase, which is in the bottom. And as a reference, I've also included the uh, equilibrium solution in the open circles, and you can see that uh, depending on where you are, and of course this is not uh, this is not known, uh, not new, but depending on where where you are in the slope and the wave conditions, um, the actual uh, wave group forced uh, infogravity wave can be significantly different than just the bound one. So it's something that uh, we need to take into account, and we would like to explore for more extreme conditions. Um, so this notion of having two uh, bichromatic wave and a response, uh, keep that in mind because now we're going towards a spectral approach where all the components within the frequency directional spectrum um, make up uh, uh, bichromatic waves. So we basically do a summation of all these different contributions, uh, but we also would like to include reflection. So if we have a, a, a wave group forced in, in infogravity wave that is uh, moving towards the coast. We actually define a minimum depth. So uh, for the simulations that I will show in a minute, we take a minimum depth of uh, 0.1 meter, a reflection coefficient, uh, which is set, uh, set at 0.6, uh, because that gives that's being used as a calibration parameter. And we assume that there's a specular reflection. So um, based on this, we define a Again, a source function. So this is a source function at the depth of, uh, or close to the waterline uh, that depends on uh, these uh, different parameters um, and where U sub F is the infogravity wave velocity of the incoming um, IG waves. Then we do the same thing as what we did with the, the free IG waves, where we basically solve for the, uh, the spectrum, but then this is for the, reflected uh, IG energy. And again, we can integrate that over the relevant uh, frequencies and directional components, uh, directional um, aperture uh, to get an estimate of the reflected infogravity wave. I'd like to compare that with uh, field observations. Um, so I picked a location uh, close to Q1 in the northern part of the Netherlands. Uh, and I'm going to use data that were obtained during the Coast 3D experiment, which is uh, partly described by Rusink et al., the paper in 2001. Um, and the uh, bathymetry of that location is shown on the right. So the color coding is the depth. Uh, and so what you see is that this bathymetry is uh, quasi alongside uniform. Uh, with a couple of uh, sandbars in it. Uh, I don't know what you can see. So there's an offshore sandbar, an nearshore sandbar. And I'm going to focus particularly on these uh, PUVs um, because they allow me to uh, separate the incoming and the outgoing infogravity waves. So I'm using the maximum entropy method to uh, look at the frequency directional spectrum and then integrate over the directional bins to get these uh, incoming and outgoing waves. Um, 
Okay, so um, this is just part of the, the time series and I'm going to, uh, of the observations, and I'm going to focus on four days. And I'm going to start with uh, a single event, which is indicated by the red arrow. Um, the significant wave height of the sea swell is given in the upper plot. Uh, frequency range between uh, 0 0.04 Hertz and 0.3 Hertz. And then for the infographic response, um, in this case, I'm looking between uh, uh, 0 0.01 hertz and 0 0.04 hertz. And I know I'm not completely consistent with my free infragravity uh, assessment, so something to consider for the future. Um, I would say the conditions are sort of you know, typical for the Dutch coast, so relatively short periods, uh, also during storm conditions. And the waves uh, are mostly shore normal. So the red line in the third panel is the the shore normal, and we see that the waves are close to being normally incident. And at the bottom, we see the tidal elevation and the super elevation or the surge uh, during the storms, uh, for instance, on the 26th uh, of October. So just a snapshot of the response. So I'm going to run the swan every hour in a stationary mode. Uh, the top panel shows a distribution at the log scale of the infogravity response, of the in incident infogravity uh, wave height. Um, the second panel is the reflected. So uh, using the specular reflection, because of the normal incidents, we see a lot of the energy is actually going out at 180 degrees, but we can also see that there seems to be uh, refractive trapping, especially uh, around the bars. Then the third panel is the comparison between the wave height that is predicted by Swan for sea swell and the observations. Um, that shows a, a reasonable match. And at the bottom, we have a comparison of the infogravity wave height that's coming in and reflected um, at the different sensor locations. Now, this is only for one uh, storm. So, oh, so, sorry, for one hour. So we can run the model for multiple hours. And then looking at the, these sensors, uh, we can see on the left uh, the predictions of the wave group forced uh, IG wave height. Uh, the model in this case is, just to confuse everybody, is the solid black line and the observations are now the dots. Um, and uh, on average, uh, for this particular part of the, the time series, we can see that there's a, a good correspondence, uh, although we we overestimate at uh, a number of locations. And then, as I said, this uh, reflection coefficient that we picked at 0.6 uh, seems to uh, uh, explain a significant part of the reflected energy. But if you look carefully, you can also see that, uh, especially in the reflections, we see uh, peaks. And uh, if you look at these peaks, then you'll see that they're actually correlated with high tides. Um, and so it's most likely that, for instance, the beach slope uh, at high tide is uh, steeper than uh, at low tide. And because of that, uh, we have uh, an increased reflection. Um, and that's also something I think they found at Duck uh, earlier. Um, all right, so where, would, where do we want to go with this? Um, well, so we actually want to uh, look at more detailed measurements, uh, especially because we are lacking information about the directional properties of the, the free infragravity waves. So arriving from remote uh, coasts, but also uh, the, the wave group forced IG waves. And we have some uh, novel observations that were obtained uh, last year um, during the reflex experiment uh, by Marion Tichet and uh, co-workers. So that's what we'll uh, be using to, to verify. Um, we're interested in uh, comparing the reflected uh, IG waves um, with the omnidirectional distribution of uh, Fabrice to see whether there's any uh, preferential uh, directions, uh, for example, or whether uh, it is indeed uh, safe to take an omnidirectional approach. And then ultimately, of course, we'd like to combine the, the different sources, so the remotely generated free IG waves, but also locally uh, generated and trapped as uh, a boundary condition to tax speech so we can compute uh, dune erosion and see what the effects are of taking into account these contributions. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Art, for your excellent talk. Let's see whether we have questions. We have a hand up from Peter Smith. Peter, please go ahead. Oh, thanks, Art. That was a great talk. Um, I was curious on the, the, the larger scale modeling. Um, Tom uh, Herbers uh, showed a while back already that at least near narrow coasts, um, the scaling of the variance actually very closely follows a one over D law. It just scales of one over the depth. Um, and this has to do with the fact that the infragravity waves are very omnidirectional and sort of trapped near the coast. Do you see this one over the depth scaling at larger scales as well? Or have you looked at that? And secondly, have you looked at how much, because these infragravity waves are low frequency, they are fairly sensitive to refractive trapping, um, very sensitive to refraction. And how does that, is that, is the resolution of your bathymetry very important in your large scale modeling in Swan? Um, thanks, uh, Peter, for your questions. <laughs> um, the depth dependence is, um, we did not look at that yet. And so the, the, the data that we have uh, is at a few locations and uh, for the free infragravity wave huh? Um And it doesn't have any directional information. Um, so it's, at the moment, uh, we're not able uh, to actually compare. Um, and therefore, we also don't know um, whether uh, because there's a tuning parameter. Huh? So let's say we make a mistake and the trapping is more significant than we think. Um, then uh, there's a tuning parameter that uh, allows us to increase the response. So what we really need is uh, a better coverage of, uh, of observations at, at multiple locations. And we've, we've been trying to do so, but I, th I also think uh, more detailed, uh, specifically more detailed information about the directional properties. and. And then there's still a, a challenge in, in discriminating between, let's say, the, the bound infragravity waves, or how they, uh, the, the directional properties of the bound infragravity waves, and how the free infragravity waves are uh, distributed. Uh, so that's, uh, that's something that we're, uh, we're working on, uh, both in developing methods, but also in, uh, in new, uh, new observations. Great, thank you, Art. Let's uh, move on to a question from Ath Athena Lange. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, we're doing similar work here at Scripps in California, and we found that on like the larger wave energy days, most of the energy is in the bound, um, like the 2D bound energy, and then like 75% to 100% of the IG energy is that and that the free doesn't really make much of a difference. But on like the smaller wave days, the free energy, both refractively trapped as well as um, remotely generated really matter. And like, have you seen similar things in the Dutch coast? I'm kind of curious at how the basin yeah. changes. So yeah, we see that, uh, let's say the contribution of the bounty for gravity wave uh, does increase, um, but uh, it's, it's it's typically not dominant okay. and uh yeah, yeah the hypothesis is that it, that is is actually related to uh, uh the fact that uh, infragravity waves are uh, are bouncing around in this in this basin okay and we don't yeah we don't have uh like uh we don't have a shell uh, with a with a deeper uh, deeper part that uh where they could escape for example yeah so, it could well be well be related to the fact that it's a relatively shallow basin with lots of uh, coasts that uh, that can reflect. Okay. But you. it's a hypothesis. So, yeah. Let's um, move on to a question from uh, Marcel Bottomer. Yes. Um, hello. Um, uh, thanks, uh, first of all, for your presentation, Art. And I wondered. Um, well, given, uh, given the ambitions uh, in several countries um, to combine um, um, uh, ambitions uh, on flood protection and on um, 
uh, nature conservation um, through vegetated foreshores. I wondered, um, did you do any research on um, the generation and propagation of uh, infragravity waves on vegetated foreshores? Um... Or did you consider doing such research? Well, not, not as part of uh, what we're doing here at the moment, uh, but uh, yes, we looked, um, that we definitely looked at uh, the, the, let's say the potential damping uh, of uh, infragravity waves in the presence of, uh, of vegetation. Um, also uh, specifically, I think also in the, uh, in the X beach modeling. Um, but for this particular research uh, that I presented here, that's not that's not part of it. But I, I think what we'd like to have is uh, is uh, uh, the boundary conditions at a larger scale, let's say at a, at a regional scale, that you can then subsequently use to uh, make local uh, local assessments or local impacts, and that could include things like vegetation, but also uh, dune erosion. Great, thank you, Art. Looking at the clock, I'm going to thank both speakers, both Janet Becker and Art Renius, uh, for today's excellent talks. And I'm going to end the session and invite you to the last Zoom, Zoom hour of the year, which is in about a month's time on wave breaking. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you.